Uh, welcome everyone to San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight's um, event is Mindful Mondays with Melina Bondi. And uh, Melina Bondi began meditating, uh, identifies with the pronouns they, them, began meditating 20 years ago, eventually taking monastic vows under the Vietnamese peace activist and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh in 2012. 2012, after six years in the monastery and a few more outside, Melina returned to lay life in 2021 to study chaplaincy and psychotherapy at the University of Toronto, as well as completing the True North Insight Community Meditation Leadership Mentor Leader Mentorship Program in 2022. They blend insight and Plum Village practices with an orientation towards somatics, justice, and creativity. Melina is queer, is queer white settler learning to live respectfully in, on the colonized land of Toronto. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, thanks, Julie. Thanks for being here. Hi, friends. Happy to see some familiar Mennonite faces and some familiar faces from elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, happy to be together. So I'd like to invite us into um, like a 10, 15 minute practice that you can do lying down, sitting, standing up, and then offer some reflections, a bit of practice again, and then open it to conversation. Um, so if you can set yourself up in a way that um, feels okay enough, supportive enough, easeful and awake enough please do so screens on or off whatever helps you and so i'll offer three sounds of the bell starting with a listening meditation into this moment the sounds arise and fade away see if you can take just a big picture view or uh, noticing a physical sensations What's the head? What's happening in the arms? The torso? The pelvis? Hips? Thighs? All the legs down to the feet. Almost like you're just taking out a bag, opening it up, noticing what's inside without catching every single detail. Just, oh yeah, here's some tightness, here's some tingling, here's some warmth, here's some coolness. 
some pressure, some buzzing, some numbness. Seeing if this whole mass of changing sensation is able to be met with your awareness. And if you're noticing areas that feel kind of tight or sore, areas that feel a little blank, areas that feel a little pleasant or easeful, can that also be part of the simple welcoming of experience? Oh. Yep, here's in this bag of this moments of experience, noticing some pleasantness, some unpleasantness, some neutralness. And you'll probably notice at some point the experience of breathing. Inhale, exhale. Or the contact points. And you might want to choose an anchor to rest in. Resting in sensations of breathing, resting in sensations of contact. Or anywhere else that you're accustomed to. For the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to explore a bit more of an active contemplation, but only slightly active. We're still wanting to mostly rest in open awareness or anchored awareness. And if anything feels a little stronger, whether that's in the pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, scale. But if it catches our attention, can we drop in a very gentle investigation of what causes and conditions might have brought this about? And you don't need to think about it a lot. It's just welcoming a little curiosity. So for me, oh yeah, that tension in my neck and shoulders. Oh yes, those strange postures I held yesterday. Probably connected. And then just let it go. No need to add judgment or long drawn out stories, just letting awareness expand a little bit from the present moment experience to, oh yeah, there, there was a precursor. Starting with physical sensations, but at some point we will also include the thought mind realm.
usefulness perhaps in the legs. Oh yeah, to get out for a few good walks this weekend. Maybe that's connected. And then resting back in the anchor of breathing or contact points. And attention wanders, we notice with kindness and intention, we invite it back to the anchor. And then when particular sensations grab hold, we can add this layer of noticing and then getting curious for a moment how where that might this have what might this have been conditioned by And then if it haven't happened already, taking a moment or two to tune into the mind, the realm of cognition, emotions, these stories and plans and memories and vibes, moods. These two are conditioned by past experience. So if, if there is some planning mind going, oh, is that, that kind of like the hamster wheel got spun all day and then I might step off the wheel, but it's still spinning. I need some time to slow down. It's kind of natural. Or if we've been in touch with some of the horrors happening in our world and communities and lives, and we're noticing strong emotions, depressive or agitated thoughts, can we make the connection? Oh yeah, it's not just a random thing that's happening. It's it was conditioned by past experience. And even if we can't find one or many conditioning factors, can we expand our sense of experience, our sense of time, to just gently have this awareness, oh yeah, All that is happening now is conditioned by the past in this life and previous lives. And not hold it quite so personally if we've been holding it personally. So we'll continue in silence for just a few more minutes. 
resting in the anchor, and then occasionally bringing in this contemplation on conditionality. So welcome again. I meant to have some moments to say hi and how are you doing at the beginning? And I am so conditioned from my years as a monastic where I would walk into the Dharma hall in silence <laughs> and start <laughs> without speaking. <laughs> but it doesn't always translate as well on Zoom, where that's part of the conditioning I bring in. Um, so knowing that this is being recorded, if anyone wants to either say or put a little, do a little hand gesture, how you're doing, that would be amazing, or put a little, little few words into the chat, seeing some, some cozy, this kind of gestures, seeing a heart, some thumbs up, uh, some nods and hellos and some prayer hands, thank you, some sleepy. Yeah, I know there's a number of us on the East Coast, so thanks for joining. <laughs> uh, it's a little late, but we're going to do our best, and we'll see where this goes. Thanks for being here. Um, so this theme, interdependent being and dependent origination in times of crisis, I mean, 
interbeing we could spend years on, dependent origination we could spend years on. So a short little talk touching on both, you know, we're going to stay sort of high level, but also know that I've actually done like a 16 page research paper on <laughs> some of these things. If you want more details on anything, I can send it to you, but I'm not going to go into that because it's not always so helpful in the day to day. But if you want more details, I can send it to you. Um, and part of why I wrote this paper last year was that I had been practicing for almost 20 years. I had been a monastic for nine of those years. And still, when I heard the words dependent origination, I had these moments of like, I, I, I get it, but like, do I really understand it? I feel kind of embarrassed. I don't really know if I understand this. I should understand this better. Okay, I'm going to use some of the academic studies that I'm in to dive in. And part of the question was that um, from some teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh, they would say, well, dependent origination, this core Buddhist teaching, it's equivalent to interbeing, to interdependence. And I thought, oh, yeah, I get that, no problem, that everything is connected. And then I would sometimes hear other teachers, especially more traditional Theravada monastics, um, who would say, no, this is a teaching on rebirth. This is a teaching on how karma works. This is a teaching that is not the same as interbeing. Um, and I would say, I don't really know how these different <laughs> interpretations are coming about about so to deal with my doubt I investigated, which is one of the ways to practice with the hindrance of doubt and it was very fruitful. Um, and i've gotten really excited about these two topics that are very related and I found out that yeah traditionally they aren't quite the same. Um, and at the heart of it is this question of what do we do with these big teachings that might seem hard to grapple with. Uh, <clears throat> that might seem like they're only for people who do long retreats so they're only for monastics and i've done long retreats i've been a monastic but i'm still more interested in what do we do in the day to day. In our times of challenges with family members in times of international conflict in times of doubt and despair and heartache and in times of joy. Um, so that's also some of the motivation tonight. Really briefly, how I come, have come to understand this um, is interbeing is a term that Thich Nhat Hanh created that comes out of the Mahayana, the Northern Buddhist school of teachings, um, that everything is interconnected. Um, there's this beautiful image called Indra's net um, that actually predated Buddhism, but was, was shared, um, shared quite a bit through Mahayana Buddhism. This notion that everything that exists, every being, is part of a net that spans the entire cosmos. And each being is, is a jewel at a knot of the net. So everything is infinitely interconnected and that jewel has all these um, uh, facets that reflect every single other jewel. So if you think of a net, you move one part and you can't not move all the other parts uh, to some degree. And we could call this general conditionality, that in general, everything has a connection to everything else. And in the Plum Village tradition, a lot of our practices uh, revolve around learning to shift the way we perceive the world to understand this infinite interdependence. So we have practices like the meal contemplations, looking into a bowl of food, seeing <laughs> the people who grew it, who cooked it, the ancestors who learned how to cultivate the seeds <laughs> that grew the trees, you know, like there's many, many ways, the people who built the roads, the ants and worms that, that helped to aerate the soil, infinite interconnection in general ways. There's also this beautiful poetry by Thich Nhat Hanh of, uh, well, prose where he writes about if you're, if you're a poet, 
and you look at a sheet of paper, you'll be able to see the cloud in the paper. Because without the cloud that rained, the tree could not grow that, that and nor could the logger have food to eat to be able to cut down the tree. Right? So these contemplations on interdependence are really essential. And they've really shaped me. I'm so grateful for them. And especially through some research by Bhikkhu Analyo, a contemporary monk and scholar who does amazing work and writes so much. I don't know how he does it. Um, and he also says that he meditates eight hours a day. And, <laughs> um, and I don't re have reason to believe he doesn't. Um, so yeah, so he actually did this wonderful research into this exact question. What's up with this mixing of interdependence and dependent origination? Um, which I was gonna put in the chat and I forgot, but again, you can reach out to me and we'll put it into the, the show notes or the, the video notes when this goes up onto YouTube in case anyone wants to find the links, I'll put them there. Um, his wording was dependent origination is a system of specific conditionality. In the earliest recorded teachings, the Buddha was teaching the specific links, the tw and often it's 12 links, but it was anywhere from like four to about 14, if you look at the many, many places that it was actually recorded across the Pali canon. Um, and it was specifically, this leads to that, and that leads to this. And I will put all the links into the chat, just in, you don't need to read them. <laughs> But if you're interested, I will put them there. Um, if you have that Dharma nerd in you, like I do, you might find it fun. And I say that with in total, total love. Um, so Paticca Samupada gets translated in many ways, including dependent origination. And uh, it consists of 12 links. A nidana is a link pointing to one thing conditions or affects the next. It's this linked series. And so in the list we see most often, it starts with ignorance or spiritual ignorance, avidya. And because there's ignorance, it conditions karmic formations or karma. Um, and because of karma or actions that have impact, um, consciousness manifests. And that's where some of the traditional teachings say, see, this is teaching rebirth from lifetime to lifetime. Not everyone says that, but that's where this comes from. Um, and because there's consciousness that conditions nama rupa, form and um, our mind and body. And because there's mind and body, the six sense spheres, ayatanas, are man manifest and are conditioned. Because of these six sense spheres, so eyes, ears, nose, tongue, taste, touch, hearing, and, and so that the, what we think of as the five senses plus mind itself cognition faculty because of that when there is there is contact with the rest of life <laughs> and from that contact pasa we have what gets translated as feeling vedana but it's this very primal pleasant unpleasant neutral does your nervous system go, oh, this is food, I want some, or something that I want and need? <laughs> or it's a danger, push it away, or it doesn't matter, ignore it. It's very, very um, primal. Sometimes we call it hedonic tone or um, feeling tone. So it's not emotions. And because of that initial nervous system response, then we have craving tanha or wanting something to happen in a certain way because of that initial 
pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. This is happening millisecond to millisecond. But in conditions like meditation, especially on long retreat, we can actually start to notice these links happening, um, which conditions grasping upadana, which conditions becoming of, some people would say the sense of self or ego, <laughs> um, which conditions birth, which some would say means next birth, and some would say, no, the birth of a ex moment's experience, which conditions old age, dying, grief, lamentation, physical pain, unhappiness, and distress, dukkha. So if your mind's spinning a little bit, um, you're in good company. That's often what happens when we try to look at this list. Um, and there are times where it's really helpful to grapple with complex teachings, to stretch our mind, to have a framework to analyze our experience. There are other times it's not so helpful. Um, the shortcuts uh, that all the teachers I've studied with from many different traditions are pretty unanimous about is that the main places you can practice, not just memorize a list, but do something about is at the link of this primal ignorance that comes through cultivating wise view. Um, and at the link between the vidana, the feeling tone, and um, the, the craving, the wanting something about it. So this pra these practices of learning to notice pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and then not run, follow into stories where I want this, I don't want that, or letting just not even realizing that our mind is going off on these trains of, yeah, there's that sound, that was a nice sound. I wonder when the last time is that I listened to that song, you know? <laughs> it's not just neutral often and then that's like oh i want to do this thing or i hate that and suddenly we're in a foul mood or suddenly we're like at the grocery store <laughs> and we have the two toes of ice cream in. <laughs> maybe that's just me um in our grocery cart because i live across the street from a grocery store <laughs> so it's easy to do um right so that's that spot is known as like one of the easiest places to, to create space, to prevent big proliferation from happening that can cause all this dukkha, this suffering to emerge. And so the contemplation that I led us in, in our meditation is one way of practicing the teaching in the general form well in the in the sort of broad strokes form of dependent origination even if you're not looking for moment by moment um is this vidin is this the feeling tone is this the contact is this the craving right but this like oh what how does something from the past condition what is happening right now to give us some space is part of the cultivating of wise view of understanding that Nothing emerges out of nothing. <laughs> Everything emerges out of something else. And especially our mind states are always conditioned by what we've been exposed to, how we've been feeling, what we've been doing. Sister Gina was the abbess of Lower Hamlet when I was a monastic there and um, in Plum Village in France. And sometimes she would say in a, in a guided meditation or a Dharma talk, the mind you bring to sitting meditation is the same mind that you had with you the rest of your day. So if you're wondering why you can't just suddenly be happy and calm on the cushion, look at how you're living the rest of your day. <laughs> and don't expect it to be entirely different. So how we live our whole lives is also our Dharma practice. So specific and general conditionality are actually slightly different teachings, but they're they're interconnected. Does that part make sense? Yeah. Um, and so this is relevant as we are looking at our individual personal things, at our formal practice. It's also incredibly relevant as we look at how we want to be interacting with 
our friends and neighbors and how to meet crisis in our lives and in the world. We can look through both the lens of general conditionality. It's like, mm, even if it seems like something's happened over there, actually there is no separation. <laughs> we can't actually get away from it. Um, just like we can't actually get away from the heartache that maybe we were hoping to stuff down or avoid, or that we were trained from birth to not be allowed to speak. You know, it's not like any of our patterns come from out of the blue. And yet it's also important to do the specific conditionality uh, reflections. Why is all of this happening in the Ukraine and Russia, in Gaza, Palestine and Israel? There are moments where it's actually important to, to go, wait a minute, nothing emerges out of nothing. No one wakes up one day and says, my life is amazing. I'm really happy and well. I'm going to go attack someone else. Uh, people living under occupied conditions do extreme things. And people who've lived through a lot of trauma for millennia i carry that into government it's one way of looking at it and i don't say this glibly in the slightest um Thich Nhat Hanh's perhaps most famous poem the poem that introduced me to the dharma changed my life it's still the center of my practice please call me by my true names came from Thich Nhat Hanh being in the middle of the crisis of the boat people um, situation who's receiving letters all the time from people who had escaped from Vietnam, half their folks in the boat drowned, they were attacked by sea pirates. And there was one day where he read one of these letters and he just could not handle it. The suffering of his people was so extreme. And he took himself on, out for walking meditation And eventually, I think at some point I did really, it took a few days, but I'm not sure about that point. Eventually, his mind was able to get to this point of wondering what are the specific conditions that brought about this situation? I even pulled up the words because I just think it's precious to use Brigham Tide's words. And he said, in learning about a young girl who had been raped by a pirate and who threw herself into the water and drowned. He said, when you learn like something like this, you get angry at the pirate, naturally take the side of the girl. If you look more deeply, you'll see it differently. Taking the side of the girl can be easy. Then you just have to take a gun and shoot the pirate. But we can't do that. In my meditation, I saw that if I had been born in the village of the pirate and raised in the same conditions as he was, I would now be the pirate. There's a likelihood that I would become a pirate. So I can't condemn myself so easily. If I was born in those fishing villages, or you were born in those fishing villages, we might become sea pirates in 25 years. If you take a gun and shoot the pirate, you shoot all of us. Because all of us are to some extent responsible for this state of affairs. Which sometimes just leaves us burning or completely devastated. And we are also part of and interconnected with the relief teams <laughs> and with those who are responding and those who are put, giving their whole lives to, to make and build peace, right? So we aren't just interconnected in one way. 
<laughs> we're interconnected with everything. I remember on one of my first meditation retreats, having this moment, I was doing walk meditation outside. There's this little trail of ants who had their little highway that I was gently stepping over every time I passed by. Did I say this a few weeks ago? Um, in any case, I'll say it again if I did. Um, and I had this moment where suddenly I was like, oh, I am one with the ants. And it was like beautiful. And I was feeling the interconnection, the interbeing really deeply and enjoying it. And I'm one with the palm trees because I was in Thailand. It was exquisite, you know? I'm one with the, the sea. I'm one with these, you know? And I was just kind of like blessing out on, on that oneness interbeing. And I kept doing my walking meditation, coming back to my steps, my breath. And then suddenly it just like burst in my head. Oh my gosh, I'm one with Hitler too. And, and something in my mind was like, oh, it, it really doesn't just work one way. It's everything. Um, and you may have your version of what kind of lands that for you. Um, And I think it's so important, especially in times of crisis, to remember the all of it in the interbeing kind of way. We are connected to all of it, the achy parts, the beautiful parts, this equanimity, the upeka that we cultivate in Buddhism. It's not so much try to pretend you're calm all the time, even though I think that there's a lot of self-help and really superficial Dharma and mindfulness that that gives the uh, impression that if you're a good practitioner, you can just stay calm all the time. But upeka, equanimity, comes from the word that etymologically is rooted to looking out over. It's like being on a mountain peak and being able to have the big picture. Not the disconnecting yourself mountain peak, but but the wide and widening and widening our perspectives so that we can't get caught in just one aspect because we just know there are countless wars and sunrises and amazing NGOs making healing art and <laughs> petty people. We are all infinitely interconnected in countless ways. It's not so personal. Um, that's one aspect. And then the, how do we deal with this is really helped by the specific conditionality. Where did this come from? I'm not sure, let me look deeper, which is <laughs> what I did with dependent origination. And we can all do with things that kind of eat at us. This is not about like obsessively getting into wormholes that never end, but this like, huh, something is eating at me and I'm, I don't know what's going on. I can learn about it. Nothing comes from nothing. Everything comes from something. Uh, even if we don't know all the causes and conditions, we can learn some. And this meditation that Thich Nhat Hanh did is something that I've applied in so many ways. It's its own, for me, it's a practice. Um, if something seems intolerable or horrific or just really confusing, this question of, huh, what would it have taken for me to do that thing that I can't fathom? It's been pretty awful. Or, yeah, what are the conditions that might have brought this about? Not to get certain and rigid and fixated about it was this, but just to open to a larger sense of time than just this happened this one day and it means this. So, no, 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 all of history is connected, just like Ty did. That gave us this exquisite poem. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the poem, I'll put the link in the YouTube also, as well as I can put it into the chat right now. So I wanted to just get a little deeper into this false equanimity before moving back to practice and opening it back up again. 
Um, Joanna Macy, who's a Buddhist scholar and amazing activist, co-creator of phenomenal group processes called The Work That Reconnects. Um, she, coined, she created this term, premature equanimity, that is very similar to John Wellwood's term of spiritual bypassing, which is how we can use our spiritual practices sometimes to skip over the messiness and to think we're in the enlightenment or we're moving towards awakening, but we're actually repressing, <laughs> avoiding. Um, and I, I've even noticed in some statements put out by Buddhist groups, and other spiritual groups in the last week. What to me sometimes feels like this premature equanimity, inviting us all to calm down. And there's, you know, if you're about to go pick up a gun, it's really good to just calm down and wait. Um, but if you are heartbroken, terrified, screaming in rage, safely in your home, just calm down. I don't know if that's helpful all the time. Um, and you can call me a bad Buddhist if you want, <laughs> but that's that that comes from having tried for many years the just calm down as my first and only practice and then realizing, whoa, I'm not dealing with a whole bunch of stuff and then anger squ squirting out in all these other directions because I wasn't letting it just have its place. And so I think that we can actually mindfully, not controlledly, but just intentionally go, I'm furious. I'm going to let myself yell for a half hour and beat my bed and then take care of my body. That's a type of mindfulness in my books. <laughs> when you're bringing that intention, you're checking like, is it safe enough? Yeah, okay. Um, and give it space so that it doesn't, you know, squeeze out in other unwanted directions. And as I was thinking about this aspect, it reminded me of the teaching of redemptive suffering in Christianity that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was well known to have spoken of, but it's kind of a very deep teaching in Christianity. Um, and it, and it informed a lot of nonviolent protest. This idea of being willing to put your body to on the line to to suffer for a cause in order to make a point. And the thing is, it actually has to involve all these things of of being intentional, <laughs> uh, being a choice that is being made to make a point to be redemptive suffering. However, a lot of religious leaders have used teachings like redemptive suffering to justify, oh, no, no, stay in that abusive relationship. You're married. This is just what God wants of you. And calling it a redemptive suffering and other variations. So there's ways, so many ways that really powerful teachings can get twisted in really harmful ways. So I always want to be careful <laughs> when sharing um, powerful but potentially twistable teachings. Um, you know, there, there's nothing intentional by choice, making a point publicly about being forced to stay in an abusive marriage. Right, that that's that actually doesn't have any of the characteristics, even though on the surface you can say, well, you know, there's suffering, but it can be redemptive. So also our equanimity, or like trying to to breathe and see all sides of a situation, trying to not get swept away in our emotions. Are we using that in a way that's actually helping us to get to the mountaintop of a wider view in order to have a compassionate and wise response. That's what the Dharma is about. Not to pull back. And it's also not about overextending ourselves. Like I can't actually like fly to Gaza and feed people. Like that's not actually helpful. I don't have that capacity, right? Uh, it's not like you have to do any and everything that comes, but, but to have this pause and go like, what can I do? 
what's needed, I'm not sure. Um, I turn to Kuan Yin a whole lot because this part of my brain does not know <laughs> usually how to find that wise, skillful response. But in the pause, we can maybe remind ourselves how to tap into that greater whatever, the earth, the wisdom of our teachers, the wise and well ancestors that were there somewhere, even if we didn't know them. Right? To, to let the teachings of our interdependence and these reflections on the specific conditionality, can they serve opening our hearts and knowing that <laughs> in our suffering and our joy, we're all connected and that there are causes and conditions that brought situations about to inform us to respond with wisdom and compassion. Then our Dharma teaching is, is, is doing what it's there for. And when it gets turned into like, I can't handle that, just I'm just going to calm myself down. Sometimes that is exactly what's needed because then tomorrow <laughs> I can do something. But if that's the pattern of only just calm down, I mean, um, that, that's, that's classically one of the, the characteristics of what we might call white supremacy culture or Eurocentric culture, colonial culture, patriarchal culture. Um, cultures of domination don't give people the space to actually trust their, their gut knowings, don't give space for our nervous systems to actually do what they're <laughs> wired to do to protect ourselves and to connect. Um, so however we choose to engage in our practice in times of crisis, can this it's very simple. Is it helping me to respond as skillfully as I can with wisdom and compassion? Or is it shutting down that function? That can be sort of a little, a little sort of like inner checklist of like, hmm, how am I practicing in times of crisis? Right? Not to beat ourselves up and not to expect ourselves to be super heroes, superhuman. Um, but it's not uncommon for even the most beautiful of wisdom teachings to get a little convoluted and I convolute them myself. <laughs> we all do. Um, but then we, we check in and we help each other and we go, wait a minute. Oh no, that wasn't it at all. Okay, now I know. <laughs> I'll try something different, so. I want to give us time to just digest this and have some quiet and then open it up. Um, I know it's not always easy to jump in after these kind of sessions, but I'm throwing out a bunch of stuff that I'm hoping <laughs> will actually uh, converse about. You may have totally different perspectives than me. You might think I'm totally off on something that's welcome. Um, you may have other reflections to add or you know, questions are welcome, but it's not so much Q&A as space for community wisdom cultivation. Um, so let's take 10 minutes of silent practice in whatever posture is supportive for you. Eyes open, closed, sitting, standing, lying down. I'll start and end with a bell.
Tuning into this moment. Resting awareness, resting the body. And waking up curiosity just a little more about how it is here and now. Letting mind and body rest in this moment. 
body breathe itself. Making space for wisdom and compassion to grow stronger. So that like two wings of a bird, they can fly. (laughs) 